Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think we'll get started a little early today because we have a, uh, a demonstration that's part of the lecture and it's going to take some time. Welcome, everyone. My name is Gary Baldwin. I'm the Director of Special Projects for Energy and Environment here at Citrus. <coughs> and uh, welcome to this, this uh, weekly seminar series. I'd like to thank Infineon Technologies for sponsoring the lunch that we serve every week. Hello to our viewers out on the web, especially our Citrus sister campuses at UC Santa Cruz, UC Merced, and UC Davis. I would also like to point out that on the table in the back of the room we have flyers that announce a companion lecture series that we hold every Friday, either in this room or in room 250 downstairs that focuses on energy. It's called the Eye for Energy series. Today we're very privileged to have uh, Dr. Jacob Rosen speaking on the topic of medical robotics. Uh, Dr. Rosen got all of his education in college uh, up through the Ph.D. at Tel Aviv University, graduating with a Ph.D. in biomedical engineering. He has an undergraduate and master's degree in mechanical engineering. He's worked on projects uh, such as EMG-based powered exoskeleton research, uh, innovative orthopedic spine and pelvis implants, surgical, robotic, and medical simulation systems, as well as many other things. He recently moved from the uh, University of Washington, where he held a position until 2008, and he is now an associate professor in the Department of Computer Engineering at UC Santa Cruz. Now, before we begin the lecture, there is a yellow sticky on the bottom of one of the chairs in this room. You have been selected, if you have that sticky, as a patient in the demonstration uh, for live... No, I'm kidding. Dr. Rosen, thank you very much for coming. Let's welcome Dr. Rosen. Thank you very much. You're on. So <clears throat> I'll try to tell you uh, two stories uh, today. And the, the common element to these stories is us, essentially. One of them is a surgical robot. Uh, and we have people on both sides, one as a patient and another one as a surgeon. And the other story is about uh, wearable robots, meaning a, a robot that you can wear on your body and uh, do many, many things with it. So the topic is robotics, but the common element is the human, human body or human being. So let's look at the big picture of uh, surgical robotics. Um, you can do... Uh, surgery right now with uh, either interacting with regular tools and touch and dissect tissues. You can do it through a robot and you can do it also in a simulation environment where you are either interacting with the virtual uh, representation of, of the tissue through a haptic device or to a, um, a real tissue in a simulation, simulating envi simulated environment. What I'll talk about are two things today. I will talk about this interface, which is the human-machine interface. And what is interesting about that interface is that regardless of the modality that you use, uh, the same information is flowing back, back and forth between the surgeon and, and the device. And there is very interesting interaction taking place over here. The second element would be the robot itself. I'll tell you the, the process of developing it and the, the way we've used it. And I'll mention a little bit about this interface, what is going here at the cellular level between the tissue and the, and the tool. So what is minimal invasive surgery? This is a, a typical scene. The surgeons are making a little hole in your body, inflate the, the volume with CO2, insert a, a light source and a camera, and also tools. So they're essentially operating under your skin. This is an operating room uh, about 100 years ago. You can see that uh, you need two buckets and, and a table, and that's all you need to perform surgery. This, on the other hand, is an operating room in the 80s, so you see a lot of uh, technology migrated into the, this room with not enough attention to the people in the room, uh, the, obviously the patient and, and the surgeon. So historically, um, robots penetrated to the operating room uh, through uh, the logic of let's predefine trajectories, 
uh, the same as in uh, assembly line and performs uh, surgery autonomously. So this works very well in places where you, you need to mill bones or uh, drill skulls. So you can pre predefine trajectories based on preoperative scanning and the, the whole uh, process can be done autonomously. But once you deal with soft tissues that are very difficult to model because they are nonlinear, non-isotropic, uh, hyperelastic, all the, the f fascinating things, then you cannot predict how the tissue would respond once you touch it. So you need to bring the, the human back to the loop. And they are essentially controlling all of these systems. So you see an evolution of systems. One of them was actually developed here, Berkeley. Uh, over the years, and I'll talk about this device over here, which was uh, developed a few years ago. So in the mid-90s, uh, uh, this was the official penetration to the operating room. It's uh, the Da Vinci system by Intuitive Surgical um, that um, still occupy a lot of space. There was one of the uh, pioneers in surgical robotics said that the, the, per the most precious real estate in the world is here, the space above the patient. So you have to occupy it very carefully because if you're not careful, then you end up with cluttered arms that usually collide with each other and it makes it very difficult to operate. So, uh, this is, a vision, this is a military vision of how uh, robots would uh, eventually, so you see it's a keep, uh, peacekeeping operation to be politically correct. Uh, this is a, a typical battle scene. Man down, man down. Uh, a man soldier back. would be injured. Here you see vital signs. So every soldier or necessarily every, every, every one of us would carry sensors on the body. These are mobile systems that are actually currently in use uh, in the military. Scanning. What is done here is a full body scan that will be compared to an existing scan. And there, is, there will be a difference obviously due to injury. Uh, what you see here is a fully up uh, automated operating room. You don't really, really need nurses. Uh, this is a tool changer. Uh, there is an, a nurse in the operating room that all of her or his role is just to hand tools to the surgeon. There is not really a need for that anymore. Some of the, these tools are teleoperated by surgeons. Some of them are, are fully automated. So and then you can evacuate the in this case, this, uh, so you can tell how much you are remote from the field by how how hard you you laugh. I have a better idea. Why don't we have the robot? So this this uh, the the movie that you you've just seen uh, was the inspiration for a, a DARPA uh, project, and the mission of that project was to develop. Uh, an operating room with no, pa no people other than the patient. So all the services to the, to the robot itself, in this case the surgical robot, would be automated. So what you see here is a room with no people. You can remove all the, the nurses. Uh, the only presence of the surgeon in the room would be, in, in, uh, in this case, the a surgical robot. Uh, the surgeon would say sponges. And then the system would respond by picking sponges from an equipment dispenser and handing the, a tray of sponges to the, to the surgeon. These are teleoperated arms. All the rest of the room is uh, fully automated. So the idea is that you can automate all the functions other than surgery itself. Um, then the surgeon can say scissors, and then the system would respond by approaching a tool changer, uh, picking a tool, and, in, and uh, picking the old tool from the surgical robot uh, itself. You can appreciate, if you are in the field of robotics, you can appreciate this uh, uh, transition uh, more than if you are not, because this is a very flexible arm, and this is a very stiff and industrial arm. And when two of these systems would interact, 
that's a, a very complicated interaction to make sure that it will be done successfully. Um, in order to streamline the process, this is, uh, it's called the Maya stand, and uh, if the surgeon would need frequently like sutures, uh, then uh, you don't need the, the big arm to do that because that's the bottleneck of this whole room. So then the, the surgeon is now uh, suturing um, from a remote place. Uh, another thing is uh, managing the operating room from uh, equipment dispensing and uh, disposing. Uh, you don't want to leave anything in the, in the body that shouldn't be there. So all these elements uh, are tagged. Uh, once you dispense them, they are registered. And then you can go back and make sure that once you dispose them, um, everything that you've used was actually uh, going out. So this is sort of a translation of what you've seen, a vision into uh, reality. I'd like to devote some of the time uh, speaking about this interface. And I'll show you two videos. One is an expert surgeon trying to suture, and another one is a first year resident trying to suture. And I'll ask you to tell me who is the expert. So it should be clear by now that the expert was here. But you can see how this uh, gentleman here is still struggling. So what you see now is an objective uh, way of assessing skill. The question is whether we, we can uh, translate what you see now to a mathematical model. So most of the things that we know about surgery came from uh, devices like that where we, we put sensors uh, into uh, regular tools. This, in this case, it's a force sensor measuring the forces that the surgeon would apply on tool. And devices like that where you attach them to regular tools and they, do, they would track tools in space. And this is an example of an experiment done on a pig. So the surgeon would perform a, a surgical task. And then we are actually recording everything that is taking place um, position orientation of the tools and all the forces and the torques applied on the tool. Um, so the data would look something like that. Uh, many channels coming out, left and right tool. You, by looking at that, you cannot tell whether this is an expert or a novice, obviously. Another interesting way to look at it, uh, position and, and forces and torques are vectors, so you can present how the tip of that vector is changing as a function of time. So you see novices and expert. So you see differences, but still um, difficult to tell which one is which, or for example, how, how far away this novice is from being an expert. So the, what, what I'll try to convince you is that surgery is a language. And um, the techniques to analyze this is, was borrowed from uh, speech recognition. So in, in the surgic, surgical language, the, the words of that language are the tool tissue interactions. And you know, if you're skilled, you'll pronounce the words appropriately. And these are different signatures of forces, torques, and velocities. And so they are actually trying, both experts and novices, trying to speak the same language. But obviously, experts are uh, speaking it more f uh, fluently. So we took this analogy and we developed a, a multi-state um, model where the words are the states and the pronunciation are the observation in each state. So um, if you look at the tool, this is a typical minimal invasive tool. You can move it in and out, left and right, up and down. You can rotate it, and you can open and close the, the handle. If you look carefully at how, they, how surgeons are actually using these five degrees of freedom, you end up with different combinations. So they can either grasp or push. They can grasp and pull. Or they can use three uh, all together, like grasp, push, and sweep. So these are the different combinations of using the, the different degrees of freedom of the tool. And there are unique signatures in each one of these words. And if you analyze the data uh, and you break it down to these uh, 15 or 16 words, you see different pronunciation of each one of the, of the words. So 
what you see is essentially the voc vocabulary of this, of this language. Uh, this is how the model uh, looks like. There are uh, multiple or 15 or 16 states on, for the right tool and the same thing for the left tool. Uh, black lines are telling you transition between uh, one state of the same tool. So they will grasp, uh, for example, the tool for a while, stay in that state, and then move to grasp and push. And they can do it with both the left and the right. The red lines are combinations of uh, two tools. So they can grasp in one tool and push with, with another tool. So, and once they are in one of these states, they can apply different signatures on, on, the, on the tool. And these are the different pronunciation of each one of these words. So each line here is a probability. And uh, apparently, uh, the way they navigate in this uh, model is skill dependent. And you can tell uh, how to do it by you know, looking at something like that. This is an expert operating or uh, suturing. And these are all the boxes here are running the model in real time, identifying the probability of either moving from one state to the other, applying a certain signature, a signature once they are in a certain state, and collaboration between left and right tools. So after you get used to look at this, you can actually tell whether this is an expert or a novice. Um, another thing that you can do once you have a model like that is you can measure the statistical distance between an expert and each one of the um, stages of training, like first year, second year, until four, fourth year. And what you'd expect is that the statistical distance is getting smaller and smaller. And this is a, an experimental result of um, about 30, 30 um, surgeons doing different tasks and what we did here is we expressed the statistical distance between each one of the training stage from first year to fifth year and an expert and you can see the learning, learning curve so in the first year of the residency they, they improve significantly then they reach a plateau and then at the fifth and the fourth and the fifth they, they approach an, an expert level. Yeah, so the bulk of the presentation would be devoted to this uh, robot over here. So you can see it's essentially a buffer between the surgeon and, and the patient. So uh, the advantage of having this, this um, information that I just showed you that was actually used initially for studying uh, skill uh, was that we can design a robot in a, in a more efficient way and avoid what is usually called an over-design where systems are bigger and, and more powerful than they need to be. So what we discovered in, when we look at the data is that 95% of the time in minimal invasive surgery, they, they spend in this 60-60 uh, 60, 60 degree cone. So there is a cone outside and there is also a cone inside. And all they do is just moving in this cone. If they want to reach any point, in, in, in this case the abdomen, they need uh, a 60 and 90 degree cone. So this is a definition of, of a workspace. And why it is important? Well, we, the, the mechanism that we decided to use is called a spherical mechanism. Uh, what is unique about that, it, it has a point here where, where all the rotation axis would intersect. And if, if you put this point where the tool would, ins would be inserted into the body, you just, you just get a pivot point where the tool would rotate around. It won't translate. So one of the questions that we ask is, uh, what should be the link lengths of these two arms? Um, we solve this by uh, a brute force optimization process. And, and you know, if you're familiar you know, with a term called manipulability in robotics, uh, this is an expression of the manipulability. But if not, I'll just give you a, an intuitive understanding. So if you look at, the, at your arm as you write, you'll see that the elbow is at 90 degrees. The reason why the elbow is at 90 degrees because uh, the, at 90, it's the perfect mapping between shoulder and elbow and, and the pen. 
It's very difficult to write like that. This is the singular configuration of the arm, and it's very difficult to write like that. That's another singular configuration. So what you get when you have 90, it's the, what is called the best manipulability of, of the pen. So this robot also has, uh, uh, we can express the manip manipulability, and then we can ask what should be the, the first two links. We are not subject to evolution, so we can pick any links that, link length that, you, that we want to give us the best manipulability. And uh, this is just showing you different link lengths and how the manipulability is expressed. And eventually, you end up with an optimal solution, which is these two angles. So what you can do when you have data is you can play back data that you record in, in, in real surgery through a mechanism, which is a design candidate at, at that point, and see if the design candidate is actually behaving as you expect. So the end result of this elaborative effort was um, uh, Raven, we called it. It's uh, two arms, a uh, telemanipulator. It has um, six, seven degrees of freedom, although only six were, were used. And it's probably the smallest manipulator that you can build that would provide sufficient uh, torques and range of motion that is required for, for surgery. Uh, so what's unique about that, um, uh, the problem is that we don't have long hands. And uh, although surgeons have very big egos, but they cannot teleoperate other, other than using uh, a surgical robot. So this is the system architecture. The surgeon is sitting essentially anywhere in the world. And you can put uh, the, the robot in a remote location. and the surgeon is generating input commands to this to these devices. You can translate it to a, a wide array of um, wired and wireless communication to the robot, and then there is a camera over here transmitting the vi the video back to the surgeon. So the surgeon is looking at the screen um, and telemanipulating the the surgical robot from from a distance. So. Um, this was the punchline of many surgical robotic talks. Uh, it was uh, the last page of Wired magazine in 2005, I think, where you see these two guys carrying a robot to a patient ha a house. And uh, obviously, a lot of people laughed when they, they saw that. But uh, a few years later, I found myself in the same situation, putting a robot in the back of a, a truck and heading to uh, what is called an extreme environment. So I'll show you a few uh, video clips that will describe different uh, teleoperation experiments. Uh, this is the robot itself. Um, so the first site was um, an animal lab, uh, just to, to have a sanity uh, check that the system is actually working on what is as close as possible we can get to a, to a human. This is a, an experiment in an extreme environment, as the military is calling it. It was done in, in Simi Valley, California, in a very remote uh, place. So you can see the, the robot is in one tent, and the surgeon is in a different tent. And there are no wires connected uh, between them. The, the way the communication is done is through a UAV. And you'll see it shortly launched. Uh, so that's the UAV. There are 5,000 of them uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan right now, and they are used for surveillance. If you look carefully, there are little antennas here. So this is the, the wireless communication. And this thing is flying around in the sky, uh, bouncing back the signal from the surgeon to, to the robot. And obviously, they don't need to sit uh, uh, cl in close proximity to each other. So the, the military is trying to push uh, this, these technologies to, uh, away from labs uh, just to demonstrate capabilities. And this is just a robot calibrating itself. Um, another thing, uh, another extreme environment in, in, this, uh, in, in the military view is Aquarius. Aquarius is um, a training facility that NASA is maintaining uh, in uh, Key Largo, uh, close to, to Florida. 
and they use this uh, device to train uh, astronauts in, in deep space missions. So they wanted to demonstrate that um, uh, astronauts would eventually fly from Earth in a perfect health, health conditions, but they might need uh, something uh, in, in their long mission. So we took this robot down to the ocean floor. Divers were taking it down. And what was done here is a, is a teleoperation experiment from Seattle to this um, to Key Largo through both wired and wireless um, communication. So the the problem with tele teleoperation is obviously time delay. Uh, just to give you uh, numbers. Um, if you introduce a time delay of a quarter of a second to a surgeon, they won't even notice that. If it's more than 250 milliseconds, they will start to complain. Uh, up to a second, they will tell you that they cannot operate anymore. Uh, the problem with time delays is that you, um, you send two, two types of information. You send position command to the remote site, and you also get video back. And you can see that uh, the, these two time delays for the video and for the position commands are different in, in, uh, in, with the numbers. Uh, another problem is that it's not, a, it's not a fixed time delay. So there is a distribution of, of time delays. Obviously, there is a peak somewhere. But uh, you are dealing with something that is um, dynamically changing as you operate. So we decided to, um, to take this, this knowledge. What, one thing that you discover in, in teleoperations is that uh, you, de you have very little time to do your experiments because you are busy deploying this, this thing in um, real places. And so we learned all the, the data of time delays in uh, field experiments, and we sort of imported it back to a lab a lab space where we can control the conditions more carefully. And what was done here is an experiment where they move blocks. It seems like a very simple uh, task, but this is a task that surgeons are using to, to train. And it's trying to emulate tissue handling. And here you can see how the, the performance is dropping uh, in, in terms of the completion time as a function of the time delay. So as you introduce more and more time delay, uh, the performance is degraded uh, significantly. Another interesting way to look at, at this data is, as I said, that there are two sources of information. There is the, the vision, and there is uh, the false feedback that, that you get from, from the robot. So, the, the space is actually uh, can be described as uh, these two orthogonal axes. One of them is a time delay in, in transmitting the video, and the other one is a time delay in transmitting the force feedback back to you. So if you are along this diagonal over here, the time delay for see and feel is the same. But if you are on over here, you can uh, see first and feel later, or if you're over here, you can feel first and see later. And obviously, um, you are one, one way or the other, you are in this space, not necessarily along this line, and as a result, your performance are, is degraded. The question is how the performance is affected by introducing different time delays in this, in this matrix. So this is the lab uh, setup. Uh, we, in a lab, we can control time delays more carefully, so we can delay the video or delay the false feedback separately. And this is an, an example of a, a subject trying to trace a square under time delays with false feedback. So the false feedback is pushing him or her away from this edge so um, they can easily trace it with, with no time delay. Uh, but what you get eventually at the end is a, a plane like that. And this plane is telling you how much uh, the performances were degraded as a result of introducing different combinations of, of time delay. And these lines are ISO performances 
in a line. line. So an interesting observation here is you, you can see that the slope in the vision is greater than the slope in the haptics or force feedback, meaning that if you are delaying vision, uh, the, the, form, the performance degraded would be degraded um, uh, much faster than if you delay uh, force. And this is uh, aligned with other um, findings, mean, meaning that we as, um, as creatures are relying on our vision more than on what we feel. So if there is any discrepancy between what you see and what we feel, we rely on what we, we see and not on what we feel. So uh, this summer, uh, this whole idea of um, teleoperation was expanded uh, greatly. And this was uh, what is called the plug fest, where different uh, robotic uh, or teleobotic uh, labs around the world were, were connected to each other. And that was led by University of Washington. And we were one of the sites. And <coughs> What is interesting is uh, in a teleoperation you have master and slave, so these are the masters uh, where the surgeon or the teleoperator is interacting with, and these are the slaves uh, who are either the surgical robot or any other robot, and you can actually mix them. So the, you, any slave can be operated by any master. And what uh, initiated that is a, an interesting protocol in which you don't really control the absolute position of the robot. You just uh, transmit increments. So you transmit Cartesian and rotational increments. And in that way, you can decouple the master and the slave in the way they are structured. So this is an example of uh, our um, Exoskeleton you know, in Santa Cruz controlling uh, another robot that obviously looks completely different and, and still you know, can be used to, to teleoperate. So this is what typically you would see in, uh, in surgery. You would see uh, two surgeons interacting with the patient. So two surgeons are four arms and two pairs of eyes. So in order to... You know, duplicate these capabilities, you um, need to bring more arms into the surgical site. And this is a design uh, done by uh, Daniel Glosman, who is sitting over here, showing uh, four arms emulating two pair of, uh, two surgeons interacting with the site. And obviously, uh, as I said, real estate, so uh, we are running a study trying to optimize uh, the workspace such that all the arms would have a, sh a shared common space where is the, s the surgical site itself and so every robot, every arm can reach any point in this uh, shared workspace. I'll just briefly mention one more interaction and this is the interaction between the tool and the tissue um, and this is a result of um, uh, a study uh, using histology. So we took uh, a piece of liver and you, we pressed it with a surgical tool. And what would result as a, uh, from that is death of tissues, the death of cells, essentially, or necrosis, <laughs> as they, they call it. So uh, you can see this uh, red spots over here where the, there is a obviously high stress applied by the tool on the tissue, and this is a finite element showing the stress distribution in this, uh, in this piece of, of tissue. This is, by the way, is a, a cluster of almost 100 uh, individual slides that were, were stitched together to give you the entire cross-section. And if, if you count the number of cells that died as a result of grasping it, you, you can see a very interesting relationship between stress and number of uh, cells that, that died. And, and the reason why this is important is because we envision the, the robot um, adding to the robot a more intelligent layer on top of the surgeon or between the surgeon and the robot. So if the surgeon is trying to manipulate tissue and the intention is not to damage any tissue, then the, the robot can limit the amount of uh, force or stress applied on the tissue. But sometimes 
the, the surgeon would like to cut, and if they don't apply enough uh, stress or force on the tissue, then the robot would encourage them to do that. So this is trying to add more intelligent uh, or embedded intelligence into the surgical robot itself. I'd like to switch uh, for the few minutes that are left and tell you about um, exoskeletons. These are examples of two systems. One of them was, was the, um, developed here. The other one was developed um, by Sarkos in Utah. And uh, the idea is that um, you can use wearable robot to do many things. Uh, you can use it as an orthotic device and use uh, to amplify human strength. And this is what you've seen in these two examples. Uh, another application is to use it uh, for uh, disabled people and um, uh, recovering uh, people from stroke, for example. You can use it as a teleoperation device, as we've used it um, in the pre one of the previous slides. And you can also use it as a haptic device, meaning that I can put you in a virtual reality and you can touch and feel uh, virtual objects. So um, I think in, in the interest of time, I'll just show you a few um, video clips of the system that we, we developed. This is uh, a seven degrees of freedom uh, arm. Uh, this is Levi Miller, a graduate student in the lab. He's demonstrating all the degrees of freedom and trying to show that you can essentially reach any point in the workspace of the, the arm. We designed it such that you can reach 95% uh, of, the, of the workspace. You can scratch your back and you can essentially touch any, any part in your body. Gravity is obviously playing a major role, so you need to compensate for gravity. So what he's demonstrating here is gravity compensation. So you can put the, the arm anywhere in space and you don't really feel the, the weight because it's, it is compensated uh, by the system itself. Now, the human arm is a redundant mechanism meaning that uh, we have more degrees of freedom that we need in order to, to operate. So in order to position that pen in space, I need uh, six degrees of freedom. I need X, Y, Z, and three angles. But the human arm has seven, meaning that I can do that. This extra degree of freedom is uh, allowing us to, do, to avoid obstacles, for example, and to cope with in cases where we are injured and one of the joint is disabled, we can still reach and use this, the other six degrees of freedom. So this redundancy was uh, designed into the system. And what is demonstrating here is that the mechanism is indeed redundant. And this is a nightmare in terms of uh, control because um, redundant mechanisms uh, have infinite number of solutions in the inverse kinematics. So. Uh, but you still need to have it if you want to simulate um, human motion. Uh, what was demonstrated here is the ability to teleoperate. And so you can have the therapist sitting anywhere in the world interacting with the device like that and then move a patient in, in a remote site. And also have uh, force feedback. So if the patient has limited uh, range of motion in one of the joints, the, the, the therapist in this case would, uh, would feel that. Just to show you that it, this is a indeed bi bilateral teleoperation, he is actually moving the, the remote side and not the other way around. So, this, the, so in, this, in this case, they, they will share uh, false feedbacks in both sides. You know, the last thing is trying to uh, incorporate virtual reality into a scenario when um, you're trying to uh, rehabilitate uh, stroke patients. And the whole uh, premise of using robotics to rehabilitate people is the fact that our brain is 
has a characteristic called plasticity of the plasticity, meaning that if part of your brain is injured, then other parts of your brain can take over and learn the functions of the, the disabled parts. So it's very um, uh, boring if you're an adult to uh, move your arm in space uh, and people just uh, give up and they, they are willing to live with their disability and uh, just because they are lazy. But if you are introducing them into a more exciting uh, environment like, where they need to incorporate some of their cognition, cognition to complete these tasks, then they are willing to, to work harder and eventually rehabilitate themselves. Um, so these are the different uh, examples of um, VR environment that we, we sort of develop. So um, I'll skip um, this part and just give you the vision. Um, so it, it, very interestingly, whether it's a surgical robot or a rehabilitation robot, um, uh, there are similar visions related to both of them. So it's likely that we will continue to see an introduction of intelligent layers into these systems. Right now, they are pretty dumb. The, surge, the, the surgical robot won't move unless the, the surgeon would initiate that. There is no intelligence whatsoever in between the two. It's likely that we will see uh, semi-autonomous operations where uh, this is the only way to overcome long time delays. So the surgeon can point to two points and uh, instruct the robot to suture between these two points. Um, it's likely that we will uh, look for a more innovative uh, bioports between, this, between, the, between any robotic system and the human body. And I specifically explore neural inputs. Um, We'll continue to see uh, teleoperation evolving because uh, we need to uh, translate skills or surgical skills to a wider populations. Uh, what we haven't seen so far, but po potentially we will see, is collaborative surgery where more than one surgeon is operating on the same patient and the two surgeons can sit in two different places and they need to share uh, the two arms. And Obviously, image guided, this is uh, slowly penetrating uh, the field where they, you can uh, operate on preoperative scans and see to um, uh, organs that probably you would never be able to do unless the robot is well registered with the, with the imaging device. So this is the end of my talk, and thank you. And, um, so before you ask questions, um, we prepared a demo for you. Uh, this is Dr. Daniel Glosman. And what we will do in this demo is we will connect to a surgical robot uh, in Seattle, Washington right now. And um, I'll just switch the displays here. So uh, what Daniel will try to do is uh, he will try to teleoperate this, this robot from this room. So while he's still connecting, you can ask questions, obviously, if you want. What are the uh, limitations, the physical limitations for uh, the the time delay for the, the video and the, um, well, I guess that's the major bottleneck, the video. The video is the major bottleneck. Um, uh, it's, the, the time is mainly devoted to compressing and de decompressing the video. Uh, transmitting it is, I don't think, is a problem because um, as network uh, bandwidth would, would increase, then uh, that would resolve the issue. Um, they are both hardware and software solutions. We've used them both. Uh, we didn't see any major advantage in using a hardware compressor as opposed to a software compressor and decompressor. So what we do in all of our experiments 
uh, is using just software. This is Skype. So um, what he's doing right now is actually controlling the robot from, from here. And you can see that it, this is pretty straightforward task. How, how big is that? Mm -hmm. the big I yeah. think this is um, 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters? Yeah. Two inches? Four inches? Well, right now he's looking at a television screen, but I would assume we have two eyes. You would like to give him a 3D view. Are you looking into that? Is that a disadvantage <coughs> of what you're doing now? So 3D obviously is something that the surgeon would, would like. And they, they, they have it right now in a clinical system where the Da Vinci is providing them 2D, uh, 3D. And they are trained with 2D. And they learn depth perception uh, very well as part of the, the training. <laughs> so that, that's the advantage of having a, a person on the other side. And so back to your question. Um, we are exploring 3D over the network. But then uh, you need to compress and decompress the two images together because otherwise the two can be out of sync of, from each other. Can you measure performance? Uh, how, how the performance is affected then? Yes. We, there is a significant difference between 3D and 2D, although surgeons won't, won't admit that. But uh, we've seen a, a degradation in performance when you compare 3D to do, 2D. Any other questions while we're watching? A... The vibration is because the tools are designed for minimal invasive setup and are pretty long. They are uh, 30 centimeters long. 30? Yes. And right now, the setup there is that there is no port here. The port is usually around here. And the port is making the, the tools more stable. And, <laughs> and that's why they, they vibrate. But there is no technical limitations uh, whatsoever in making them shorter and probably thicker. Now, uh, the reason why they are so thin, there are five millimeters in diameter, is because uh, you want to minimize the impact of the, the damage that you make to the skin. Um, if you go be below two millimeters, you don't even need to suture the tissue. It will just heal by itself. If it's five millimeter, you need to, to suture. So the whole plan right now is to uh, use tools with smaller and smaller diameters to minimize the impact on, on the other parts. Did I understand correctly you're using Skype to transmit the video right now? Yes. Is there somewhere where you can see what latencies you're actually experiencing, both in terms of when he moves and or? Well, we, we don't, we, I don't think we have this capability with Skype. But when we did uh, hardware compression and decompression, we could look at, at the latencies. And I think I had, I had a slide um, showing that it can go up to a, a second delay if you transmit the signal across the, uh, the continent. Do we have any other questions from the audience? One back here. Are they incorporating uh, damping in, like, I guess, um, in a software layer in the operating theater at this point? Or is that in the future? Well, I, I'm not sure if, if I understand the term damping correctly, but... Uh, so, uh, tremors, in, tremors in the surgeon's hand. Right. So the, the, the surgeon and the... And the the two, the robot, obviously, uh, they are disassociated in that in that respect. 
you can uh, introduce uh, scaling and he's actually using scaling right now so his movements are larger than the movements of the robot and you can introduce any filter that you want including damping or um, trying to uh, avoid tremor um, and clinically I don't think it's, it's used but it's certainly feasible technically. Thank you.